Hello everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar. Today's presentation, Steps for Success, Your NPIP Biosecurity Audit, is part of the USDA's Defend the Flock campaign, promoting awareness about the importance of biosecurity and ways to prevent the spread of infectious poultry diseases. We are here today to support you and your flocks with expanded biosecurity resources. I'm Dr. Chrislyn Wood Nicholson with the USDA. Today I'm joined by my USDA colleague, Dr. Elena Banky, Senior Veterinary Coordinator for the National Poultry Improvement Plan, Dr. Julie Helm of Clemson University, and Dr. Christy Scott of ESA America. Before we get started, we want to let you know that closed captions are available for this program. For anyone who wishes to view the real-time streaming captions, type the caption URL that you see on the screen, bit.ly slash USDA webinar captions into your browser. The URL appears at the bottom of every slide, so you can link the captions at any time during the program. Please note that the URL is case sensitive. We'll take a few minutes to introduce ourselves. I'm Chrislyn Wood Nicholson, and I've worked with USDA Veterinary Services for the past 15 years as a poultry specialist, veterinary medical officer. Mainly, I work with the Low Pathogenic Avian Influenza Surveillance Program and District 1 on the East Coast. I communicate with both large and small producers and other stakeholders about biosecurity and disease prevention on a regular basis. I also serve as an NPIP compartmentalization auditor and work with Dr. Elena Banky and primary breeder companies conducting biosecurity audits. I have responded to many low path avian influenza incidents on the East Coast and the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak in 2014-2015 as a case manager and biosecurity specialist. Dr. Benke, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, thanks, Chrislyn. I currently serve as the senior coordinator of the National Poultry Improvement Plan. One of my roles is to guide our official state agents like Dr. Julie Helm to manage the NPIP program in their individual states. Nationwide and in Puerto Rico, the NPIP has participants that represent around 7.7 .7 billion birds and offers testing programs for different types of poultry breeders and commercial poultry. The program for today's focus centers on biosecurity and prior to my time at NPIP, I worked in different companies within the poultry industry as a veterinarian in charge of biosecurity programs for several thousand birds. As senior coordinator, I draw on these experiences to help states assist their companies with program implementation. I'm glad to be here today. Thank you, Dr. Benke. Dr. Helm, thank you for joining us from Clemson University. Please tell us about your background and your work in the state of South Carolina. Thank you, Chrislyn. This is Julie Helm, and I'm a poultry veterinarian for Clemson Livestock Poultry Health, known in the state as the Biosecurity Queen, but I'm actually the NPIP Official State Agent, or OSA, for South Carolina. I have coordinated the NPIP program for 23 years. I'm happy to join you today, along with the APHIS team. Thank you, Dr. Helm. And Dr. Scott, thank you for participating. Please tell us about yourself and your role at ESA America. Thank you, Chrislyn. My name is Christy Scott, and I'm a production poultry veterinarian for ESA America, which is a commercial table leg layer company. In several states, I oversee the health and welfare of approximately 6 million layer chickens. Prior to this, I worked for a broiler company and then a turkey company. I've been in my current position for approximately 17 years, and I'm happy to be with you all today. Back to you, Kristen. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Our goal today is to provide information about the status of the NPIP ruling 
and provide information for flock owners who will be required to participate in NPIP audits. We'll cover an overview of NPIP audit requirement, preparing, reviewing, and revising biosecurity plans, and USDA resources. Please feel free to submit questions by clicking the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. APHIS and our guest veterinarians will answer all questions after the webinar has concluded. The Q&A will be posted along with the recording of this webinar on the APHIS website. Be sure to follow the Defend the Flock campaign on Facebook and Twitter to find out when the Q&A and recording are available. We'll share those online discussions at the end of the webinar. Dr. Benke, will you start us off with a review of MPIP? Yes, I'll be happy to. The NPIP is a voluntary cooperative program through which state, federal, and industry officials work together to approve and use new diagnostic technology for poultry improvement in the country. The NPIP provisions and program standards contain the rules for participation, and biosecurity is an integral part of the requirements. In fact, Standard C in the program standards is devoted entirely to sanitation with special attention to house design and construction, equipment and vehicle cleaning and disinfection, and hatching egg sanitation. NPIP participants can earn certifications by following biosecurity standards and by monitoring and testing their flocks, which demonstrates freedom from diseases. Classifications like Pelorum typhoid clean and H5H7 avian influenza monitored are important for both domestic and international trade recognition. Currently, the NPIP has official certifications in three disease categories, salmonella, mycoplasma, and avian influenza. Now, NPIP programs for avian influenza are surveillance-based for low pathogenic avian influenza. However, highly pathogenic avian influenza is considered a foreign animal disease. In fact, the devastating highly pathogenic avian influenza incident in 2014 through 2015 that was concentrated in the upper Midwest was the most expensive animal health incident recorded in U.S. history at almost a billion dollars spent in response and indemnity activities alone. The HPAI interim rule on indemnity payments went into effect in February 2016 in response to that costly incident. The final rule was published by the USDA in the fall of 2018. The NPIP 14 biosecurity principles, in essence, provide a framework for producers to successfully meet these new indemnity eligibility requirements specified by the rule. Epidemiologic analysis reports from the high path event in the Midwest had identified certain risk factors that contributed significantly to the spread of the virus. The NPIP 14 biosecurity principles were developed with these risk factors in mind with extensive input from all segments of the poultry industry, including large and small private companies, researchers, states, and the federal government. The thought process was that by incorporating these 14 points, future viral spread could be halted more quickly. And furthermore, the groups wanted to ensure that indemnity monies were not awarded to complexes in which biosecurity was deficient or absent. Participation in and compliance with the 14 biosecurity principles allows companies and their growers to follow a general consensus guideline that demonstrates substantial effort to control diseases. Simultaneously, the program allows flexibility to fit various types of operations. A benefit for participation is that having a solid biosecurity plan helps control other diseases besides just avian influenza. 
for producers that meet certain size requirements to be eligible for indemnity, biosecurity plans must address all 14 of these principles. And those size requirements are listed here. For example, layer flock participants need to raise more than 75,000 birds in a year to be subject to the final rule. Remember, participation is voluntary. I mentioned in the previous slide that one advantage of complying with the 14 biosecurity principles is generalized disease control. Another advantage is that should your operation be unfortunate enough to experience a high path event, your company would now be eligible to receive money for indemnity. You may notice that certain smaller operations are exempt from participation, which is similar to the low pathogenic avian influenza program in the NPIP. Smaller operations may still find considerable value in getting involved, however, and the small flock owners may still be eligible for indemnification. Now this timeline shows in detail that the high path interim rule on indemnity became effective in 2016, which was later adopted and published as a final rule in August of 2018 with an effective date of September the 14th, 2018. To give you a greater appreciation for the 14 points, the development stages took about a year from the middle of 2015 to around the middle of 2016, and the final version passed with a unanimous vote from all sectors of the poultry industry at the NPIP's 42nd Biennial Conference in Washington State in September of 2016. A corresponding audit tool was developed over the course of the next nine months, again with widespread input from the poultry industry and from states. The NPIP trained states on the implementation of the 14 points in May 2017. Ever since, states have been working with their companies and growers to ensure compliance. The expectation is that all eligible parties wishing to be considered for high pass avian influenza indemnity will comply no later than September of 2020, which offers a two-year grace period from the date the final rule became effective. The 14 biosecurity principles are incorporated into the NPIP's program standards, standard E, which can be found on the NPIP website at www.poultryimprovement.org. Now I'll turn it back to you, Chrislyn. Thanks, Dr. Benke. Great summary. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Helm and Dr. Scott for discussion of biosecurity plans and preparing for the NPIP audit. Thank you, Chrislyn. This is Julie, and I'll be covering the list of the 14 NPIP biosecurity principles. As mentioned, the poultry industry supports these principles and has taken ownership in developing the very best biosecurity programs for their operations. The first thir 13 principles in the list were identified because they represent the greatest risk factors for transmission of highly pathogenic avian influenza between the farms. These 13 principles are also the components to be included in your biosecurity program and will be audited by looking at your biosecurity plan and how you implement your program. These include biosecurity responsibility, training, line of separation, perimeter buffer area, personnel, wild birds, rodents, and insects, equipment and vehicles, mortality disposal, manure and litter management, replacement poultry, water supply, feed and replacement litter, reporting morbidity, the number of sick or affected birds, and mortality, the number of dead birds, and finally, auditing. Once again, the expectation is that all NPIP participants will be in compliance by September of 2020. You may be able to do a mock audit with your own official state agent, and we recommend that you reach out to them to inquire about this opportunity. So, what is the NPIP biosecurity audit? This is a desk or paper-based audit performed in the office and not on the farm. The audit checks that you are in compliance with your biosecurity plan. It may find areas that you need to improve on. 
passing this audit is required to be eligible to receive indemnity or money for the market value of your birds who died from a high path AI infection. Christy and I are going to discuss how we would perform the audit in South Carolina using Christy's egg layer company as an example. Christy also has facilities in other locations and she will be giving examples of how it might be handled in other states with different farm situations. Some of the examples we are giving may not apply to you exactly, but most are similar for egg layers, broilers, and turkeys. So some pro tips for a smooth audit. Who needs to be there? When I show up for an audit, this is who I expect to be there. At a minimum, the biosecurity coordinator needs to be there. In South Carolina, I am choosing to do my audits in person with each company, but this is not required. Other states may perform this audit through email, mail, and discussions over the phone. Christy, who is your biosecurity coordinator, and how do you organize this for your companies located in several states? Well, in my program, I'm the biosecurity coordinator, but with having multiple states, what I've done in my plan is I've named myself as the biosecurity coordinator overseer, and then I have individuals that are located in all the other states as the individual biosecurity coordinators for those locations. And besides the coordinator, there may be other personnel and caretakers involved during the audit who also help implement the biosecurity program. What records are needed? The records you should gather to have available for the audit include your biosecurity plan and any other documents or records that support the implementation of your plan. Remember, we are not going out to the farms to see this in action. Christy will give some examples of documents and records as we go through each of the different principles. Principle one is biosecurity responsibility. The biosecurity coordinator is responsible for the development, implementation, maintenance, and ongoing effectiveness of the biosecurity program on the farm, production site, production complex, or at the company level, depending on the type of operation and how you write it within your plan. The biosecurity coordinator must be knowledgeable in the principles of biosecurity, must be responsible for implementation of the biosecurity program with personnel and caretakers, and must review the biosecurity program at least once per calendar year and revise the plan as necessary. Christy, as a biosecurity coordinator, what are your key areas in your plan? Well, a biosecurity plan needs to be site specific. And I define in my plan what site specific means. It can either be at the farm level or complex wide containing several different premises. I have a master biosecurity plan that is the same for all of my facilities in all my states. Then the supporting documents are unique to the location. And every location has its own risk level that needs to be taken into account. For example, there's a higher risk with migratory shorebirds in the northeastern farms compared to my South Carolina farms. Unique to the farm is the records and how those records will be used, kept, and stored, either electronic or paper. But they should be maintained for at least three years. And as you'll see, everything goes back to training. All 13 principles relate back to training in one way or another. But most importantly, for writing a plan and passing an audit, is not to write what you think the auditor wants to hear, but to say what you do and do what you say. Principle number two is training. The training materials need to include farm site specific procedures as well as company or complex wide procedures. Documentation is needed that all poultry owners or caretakers who enter the perimeter buffer area, and that's the outer area of the farm site, have completed biosecurity training at least once, one time per calendar year. This also includes new poultry caretakers that are trained at hire. Christy, what type of records would you show me for this principle? <clears throat> well, I would show you training logs where the poultry caretakers, which includes my contract growers and my company employees, have attended and signed off on a training session on biosecurity. I would also have what topics were included in the training attached to the training log. 
And this training is also part of a new hire package where the new employees sign off on the policies and we then keep a copy of this in their personnel file. Principles three, four, and five are about the line of separation, the perimeter buffer area, and personnel. In principle three, I have to either describe or illustrate the boundaries of the line of separation or the LOS around my farms. I choose to do this with an illustration within my farm specific plan. In this picture, the blue line shows the boundaries of the LOS. This blue line follows the outside walls of the chicken house and the egg conveyor belt between the houses. The same idea is true for principle four, the perimeter buffer area or PBA, which I think of as the functional working area around the farm. I illustrate the PBA boundary with a red line. The PBA can get modified when birds move in and out and manure moves out and some other situations. There also needs to be procedures that are clearly outlined in your plan for caretakers, visitors, or suppliers crossing the line of separation or the perimeter buffer area. Christy, what can you show me to prove this is being done? Well, I would give you our procedures on our Danish entry and how we enter the bird houses. What do you mean by Danish entry? Can you give an example of that? Well, in our Danish entry procedures, it would be on how to enter the houses. So when entering, you would enter through a designated door into a dirty zone, sit on a bench and either remove your outside shoes or put on shoe covers, taking caution not to place your feet back onto the floor of the dirty zone. You'd swing your legs over and stand in a clean zone if you're using shoe covers. If you're using farm designated shoes, then you would walk in socks over to get those shoes and put them on. And then you'd put on your coveralls or your company issued coveralls or farm clothing. And then you'd put on a hairnet or farm dedicated hat and bandana or bandana. You'd sanitize your hands and anything else that you're gonna be bringing into the barn like any tools or phone or scissors or anything like that. You'd enter the barn after stepping through a designated foot band. When you're exiting, you would also follow these same kind of procedures by exiting into a clean area, remove your coveralls, you're gonna throw away anything that's disposable, and then you're gonna put anything that can be put into a laundry bin or stored for later use, like a hat or bandana in a cubby that needs to be used later. You're gonna walk over to the bench and then you're gonna swing your legs over after you've taken off those shoe covers and leave them on the clean side. You're gonna walk over to the outside, sanitize your hands and any equipment that we've brought into the barn. I'd then also show you the training that we've done for the people that have to go through this Danish entry. Principle five is details about biosecurity procedures and personal protective equipment or PPE for site dedicated personnel and non-farm personnel. And you gave example of that in your Danish entry. It also includes what procedures are to be done if personnel have had exposure to other poultry and avian species in order for them to re-enter the perimeter buffer area. How do you handle this? Well, I'd give you our visitor log and that includes the visitor's name, the visit date, who they're there to see, and a statement that if they had exposure to any birds within the last 48 hours, they're to report it to the person they're visiting so that we could stop them from going into our area with poultry. I would also show you in our plan, the policy for personal protective equipment we use to enter this perimeter buffer area for our visitors and our employees. Principle six is asking about pests. What control measures do you have for wild birds, rodents, and insects in your biosecurity program? Well, with pest control, I would go through our policy, procedure, and proof. Our policy would be in our biosecurity plan of how we're gonna handle pest control in general. And then our procedure would be the details of how are we going to monitor for and control for the pests. For example, we would have a written procedure of how frequently our bait stations are checked, what they're baiting with, as well as where the bait stations are located. Our proof would then be the records of monitoring for these pests at the farm level. For example, our walking fly tape record, 
bait station monitoring records, pesticide usage log, and then training, of course, on how to properly monitor for these pests. Principle seven is about equipment and vehicles. What records can you show me that you are performing cleaning, disinfection, or restricting the sharing of equipment and vehicles? I would show you our written procedures for equipment and vehicles moving between farms. Our policy says that the movement of equipment from poultry farm to poultry farm should be limited, but if equipment or vehicles must be moved, then we have specific instructions to follow. This procedure talks about the difference between equipment that has entered a poultry barn and equipment that has been on the farm but has not entered the barn. I would also show you past training records where this topic has been covered. My plan also includes how cleaning and disinfection may be intensified during elevated disease disease threats. Principle eight is asking about your mortality disposal plan. How would you show me that you are properly removing and storing bird mortality and what kind of pest control there is around the storage and disposal areas? Well, each state is different on how mortality disposal is handled. I would give you the farm specific mortality plan that includes mortality management. One site might have deep pit burial and another would have composting the mortality within the manure. But what they have in common is a written plan of how to handle the mortality. Rodent records around the disposal site would be bait station monitoring and pesticide usage logs. Principle nine is asking how your procedures in handling manure and spent litter that limits the spread of infectious disease. Most states have rules governing the transportation and application of manure. We're following these rules, for example, having trailers covered when hauling manure. And we would prove that we are following the rules by providing our training of these different laws. Principle 10 is about replacement poultry. Christy, what supporting documentation do you have showing that your replacement poultry are sourced from flocks that are in compliance with NPIP guidelines, that the transportation vehicles are cleaned, disinfected, and inspected, and what protocols you have in place for equipment and personnel involved in this transportation? Well, I have the NPIP movement forms, or the VS 9-3, that shows my chicks come from NPIP breeder flocks, and that my out-of-state pullets come from appropriately tested flocks. For in-state movement, I have disease testing documents. I also have letters of guarantee from the live haul company that the transport vehicles will be clean and disinfected prior to move. When birds are moved, our service person, person visually inspects the transport vehicle and documents that on an animal well form, form that I can show you. Principle 11 applies to water used for drinking, evaporative cooling, and cleaning surfaces. Christy, where do you source your water from? That's easy. Our water is from deep wells on all farms, and that's stated as a requirement in our plan. And yes, that is the simple answer to this question, if your water is from a contained supply, such as a well or municipal system. However, if your drinking or evaporative water comes from a surface water source, then I would be looking for water treatment records. For surface water being used to clean or flush other surfaces, then I would need to see records showing subsequent disinfection after this is employed. Principle 12 is about feed and replacement litter and how it is stored and maintained to limit exposure to wild birds, rodents, insects, and other animals. Christy, do you use litter and have litter storage in your table egg facilities? Believe it or not, in our cage-free sites, we do use a small amount of litter. And in our program, we have litter delivered in bags directly into the house, so there's no need to store it. I understand this would be completely different for other types of poultry operations, such as broiler and turkey farms, though. For other companies who use litter, I would be asking for their procedures and documents on how they perform this. For your feed, how would you show me that you are storing feed in a manner that limits contamination by wild birds, rodents, insects, and other animals? And how do you address feed spills outside the line of separation, but within the perimeter buffer area? Well, I would show you in our program that we have a procedure for the feed bin lids to be closed after the feed is delivered. In the same program, feed spills are addressed 
and they are to be cleaned up in a timely manner. The weekly service report looks for feed spills and open feed bin lids, so I would be showing that to you as well. I could also show you training records where this topic was covered. Principle 13 is about reporting elevated morbidity and mortality. Christy, what type of records would you show me that you would know your morbidity or mortality is above expected levels? And how do you report this to responsible authorities and take action should you suspect a reportable disease agent? Well, every day, mortality is recorded on the farm. Within our company, we have a critical alert communication system that notifies certain people within the company if there's a problem such as an increase in mortality. I'm one of the people that is notified if there's an increase in the number of sick birds or if mortality increases. And as the veterinarian, I determine if samples or birds need to move on to the diagnostic lab for testing. In one of in my programs, I have a list of the different state agencies that would need to be contacted in the event of a suspected reportable disease. Principle 14 is the audit itself. Auditing is based on flock sizes or the total number of birds raised in a year as shown in the earlier slide. This paper-based assessment audit will be performed at least every two years or a sufficient number of times during that period by the state NPIP OSA to ensure that the participant is in compliance. Well, Julie, what happens if I fail my document audit with you? Well, then you can request to have a check audit performed by a team appointed by the National NPIP Office, which would include myself as the state OSA, an APHIS poultry subject matter expert, and a licensed accredited poultry veterinarian familiar with your type of operation. And let's hope that doesn't happen. And it should not happen if all the 13 principles that we covered are included in your biosecurity program on your farms, that it is written clearly in your plan and documented as being performed. And once again, as Christy has said, say what you do and do what you say, which is very critical for plans and auditing. Christy and I hope these examples will be helpful to you as you prepare for your audit. Chrislyn, we turn this back over to you. Excellent information. Thank you, Dr. Helm and Dr. Scott. I'll conclude our presentation with an overview of the resources available through USDA APHIS that can help enhance biosecurity practices at your site and support your preparations for the NPIP audit. APHIS Veterinary Services is developing a library of checklists that provide practical tips and recommendations to support each of the 14 NPIP principles. We encourage you to visit the Defend the Flock website to view and download the checklist and incorporate in your training programs. All of the checklists are available in multiple languages, including Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Tagalog. Recent additions such as the checklist covering the role of the biosecurity coordinator in training will be especially helpful for the MPIP audits. New checklists will continue to be added throughout the year. The Defend the Flock website has many other free tools, including videos, recordings of prior webinars, and graphics for social media that can help you promote biosecurity on your site and to your stakeholders, no matter the size of your flock. All of the USDA APHIS Defend the Flock materials can be found on the campaign website at the bottom of the slide, aphis.usda.gov slash animal health slash defend the flock. You can also find additional information about the National Poultry Improvement Plan at poultryimprovement.org. Be sure to check out more helpful information on our social media channels. This presentation, along with the answers to your questions, will be available for download from the Defend the Flock website shortly. Be sure to follow Defend the Flock on Facebook and Twitter to be notified when this presentation is available. And use the hashtag Defend the Flock when sharing or posting information to help us spread the word. And before we go, on behalf of my APHIS co-host, Dr. Elena Banke, thank you, Dr. Julie Helm and Dr. Christy Scott 
for sharing your valuable insights and knowledge with us today. And thank all of you for joining us on this webinar. And let's keep our poultry healthy together.